Hello, everyone. Hello. Testing. Oh, hi. Hi, guys. I'm back again. Um, <laughs> so uh, I have the great pleasure of moderating today's uh, discussion uh, on the topic of exotic compute. And up on the stage with me here is Jean Ann, who you just heard from uh, her about the wonderful work she's working in neuromorphic computing. Uh, we've got Andrea here from uh, Accenture Laboratories, who's uh, working also in, in neuromorphic space, but more in the software angle. And uh, we, we have Dan from BitBio, uh, who's a stem cell biologist and you know, a, a collaborator of ours as well. So uh, a round of applause to our uh, speakers. So I guess we'll, we'll start off the conversation with this, this topic of exotic compute. What is it? What, do we have a definition or does, you know, I'll, I'll open it up to, you know, maybe we start with Dan and what, what do you think about this topic? Well, um, I'm not necessarily a computing person myself because I'm a, as you said, I'm a stem cell biologist, but I, I would think that exotic computing is everything apart from the standard computing that we're doing right now. I mean, uh, yesterday we heard a lot about quantum computing. Uh, you showed an example of biological computing. So I think anything that we can use to process information uh, in like non-standard ways, I would, uh, I would define as exotic computing. Hmm. Andrea? I think I'd agree with that. I mean, definitely non-von Neumann systems, right? Where we're not using typical silicon and typical architectures. Um, I'd like to extend that a little bit to um, more of the manufacturing material side, right? Looking at um, non-traditional things that we might think of where it's like you have electronic traces that are built from, um, you know, not silicon based or um, of course biology as well. Yeah, carbon based stuff, right? Yeah. Yeah. And Jean? Uh, yes, I agree with all of that. I think that exotic computing can exist to all these different levels. So we can have new devices, we could have new circuits, we could have new systems, new architectures. And it's a fluid definition. I've seen over my career so far, um, some, on me on the device side, some devices that were considered exotic and now have become more standard. And then new things are coming out that are considered exotic. Yeah. But generally, I like this definition of thinking beyond the von Neumann architecture. Yeah. Speaking of the von Neumann architecture, um, anyone want to talk uh, and comment a little bit about that? Seems like that's your area, Jean. Do you want to give us a... Sure, yeah. yeah. So um, our computers today, the ones we see in our phones, the ones that are used in supercomputers that provide so much to us, uh, generally have um, processing and then they have memory. And um, there is a huge bottleneck today it's called the memory wall which is basically that we're severely constrained by memory access in this type of processing and memory architecture, the von Neumann architecture. Uh, one example is when any big data process, for example, genome sequencing. Mm. Uh, if you look at the time that genome sequencing takes, 96% of that time is memory access. Only 4% is actually doing the compute. Mm. So this is a huge wall, the thing of like a mountain that, that we're facing. And so a lot of these um, exotic computing, at least in my field, is to try to think of ways that we can combine memory and processing together beyond this von Neumann architecture to overcome that wall. Excellent. That's a very good summary for that. Um, Andrea, do you want to add anything about your thoughts about the von Neumann architecture, any sort of limitations we may foresee you know, in the coming future, and why we need this kind of you know, exotic compute? Yeah, I mean, obviously that latency issue um, that G9 was talking about is one of the biggest issues, right? Um, and when we start to eliminate that latency, one of the things that we can definitely do is start to think about real-time processing at the edge, right? So I think that when it comes to neuromorphic, at least, um, that's the big benefit for us, right? Can we do real-time learning and adaptation at the edge? Can we start to identify ways in which we can, you know, work for or work better for individuals, right? So we have, right now, a lot of our systems are trained in the cloud with tons and tons and tons of data, right? And that is limiting in a lot of ways. We can't really represent the diversity that we have or that we need um, for everybody with that amount of data. It doesn't matter how much data you have, you're still gonna be leaving somebody out, right? So being able to do that real-time adaptation at the edge is gonna be, I think, critical to um, solving a lot of the AI bias issues, actually, that we're seeing today. Mm, excellent. 
Dan, do you want to add anything about this? Uh, I mean, you're not from the computing space, but uh, I guess, well, how do you see these, these things and you know, what, what's happening in the sort of stem cell biology space? Because I know there's a lot of um, incredible like, progress in, say, DNA computing. There's also questions of, you know, are ribosomes, you know, the, the actual factories for the proteins, are they actually two incomplete machines, right? Yeah. Um, I mean, I, I agree with you guys. Uh, it's, it's mostly about addressing challenges. I mean, whatever, whatever sector you're in, right, there, there's always a limitation. Is it like accessing memory? Is it data storage? Is it like uh, computing power? Um, like from my perspective and, you know, what, what you just showed is like we are at BitBio, we are actually building cells. So we're making cells with reprogramming. It, it's an approach of changing cellular identity. Mm. Uh, and I mean, obviously, in this space, in, in this very nascent space, because I mean, you, you probably showed one of the first examples of, of uh, really a, a physical, biological neural network in a dish doing some work. Mm. Um, there's lots of, lots of challenges, right? Lots of barriers still, right? I mean, like, it, it's kind of the, the, the simplest version of that is there, but I mean, we can add a lot to that, right? Mm. We, can, we can add other cell types. We can have excitatory and inhibitory neurons. We can have glial cells that, that would actually like support the neurons and, and support faster conduction velocities. Uh, uh, you know, like all those things can be added. We can make them more complex, those networks. And so in a, in a way, um, again, we've heard a lot about quantum computing and uh, like I'm more from the side of we, we're trying to build the hardware, we're trying to build the, the pieces, right? Mm -hmm. um, so uh, putting it into perspective of Puzzle X, uh, it's, it's about the metaverse, and if it's in the biological realm, uh, then we're trying to make the pieces of that. So we're trying to make actually every cell type in the human body, like we're trying to make every subtype of neuron, every subtype of glial cells, and so I think those are all the pieces that right now are not really there, yeah. And then we can, we can give those pieces to you and you can put them together and, and do amazing things. May, maybe like uh, play more complicated things or, or do, well, Bitcoin trading, as you said. <laughs> well, you can be my intel to my Apple. So that, that, that hopefully might be the future one day. Um, yeah, no, so I think it's, it's, it's a fascinating space, you know, and, and, you know, we've seen some different perspective. But, uh, you know, maybe I'll open it up to, to the speakers. You know, are there, are there particular areas that you think, you know, we... We, we need to approach, and are there anything in, in, in your particular fields that is, is particularly, particularly exciting that you would like to share with the, the audience um, about you know, alternatives to A von Neumann machines, and you know, maybe we can touch on later about uh, things like, you know, is, there, is there really an end to Moore's law, or is it coming, or is it just you know, hypothetical, um, uh, uh, worrisome kind of thing? So anyone want to start? Um, so the first question was about um, what am I excited about in yep. exotic computing? Yep. So, um, you know, you just saw my talk. I'm really excited about there's a lot we can harness that hasn't been harnessed in our materials. Mm. So, you know, our, our transistors are these really fine-tuned machines that can make zeros and ones using current. Mm. And that's pretty much all we use right now. And so I, mean, I showed some examples on artificial synapses, but there's a lot of other spheres of computing that these materials can impact. Um, and I think it's like, you can think of it as a nearer term, in my mind, solution or a, a parallel solution to what quantum is trying to do. Mm. So um, in my group, we also work on probabilistic computing. So we can take this nano magnet and then we can have it just randomly sample its position over time. And so we've been showing that that can be a true random number generator. Ooh. And so um, in this very nice co-design project uh, sponsored by the, the US Department of Energy, we're then applying that to particle physics experiments. Yep. And um, it's really exciting to see from their application perspective, they used random number generators to analyze their particle physics experiments. And they could see the huge benefit if we could have a small device that was doing that without having to use a CMOS circuit, a huge CMOS circuit. So I think that I'm really excited about these areas where we can see that the new materials can make a big impact and try to go there. Incredible. That's fascinating. Andrea? Yeah. Yeah. So for me, my team also does um, research on smart materials and energy. And one of the things I'm really excited about is to actually have some self-sustaining systems 
um, that um, are intelligent, right? So we can use smart materials as actuators, as sensors um, in the world, combining that with neuromorphic systems, right? Especially biological ones that um, have a sustainability component to them as well. Um, and then also energy harvesting and storage, right? So then you've got these very small devices out in the world that can do a lot of different things and we can start to think about also what the end of life of these devices can look like um, such that, right, they're fully degradable or decomposable um, or much more um, easy to get rid of than today's electronic uh, components. Excellent. And I, I think this is, you know, something that's something we don't think about usually, right? Because when we think of computing, everyone wants to go faster. Everyone wants more, more CPU, more, more compute. But no one ever thinks about it. what happens to that last machine where it wasn't fast enough. And you know, is it is it in a landfill somewhere? You know, previously we had some lead stuff in the in the solder, salt but now you know that's been cleared up. So I think you know the other question is potentially would e exotic computing also encompass the more sustainable side of things, right? It may not be faster, it may not be you know better at crunching, but it will be friendlier, right, to the environment. Yeah, and that's especially important as we're trying to bring more and more intelligence into the world to drive the metaverse and to drive these other new technologies that we're moving towards today. Yep. Dan, can you tell us what's going on in, in, in stem cell land and what, what excites you in that space? Yeah, so, uh, so I think uh, in that space, I mean, obviously, I'm, I'm very excited about uh, the whole space of cellular reprogramming, making certain cell types that people use for all sorts of applications. I mean, you, you're making kind of biological computers. Some uh, a team in, Nether in the Netherlands is making a sausage out of our muscle cells, and you know, like it, th there's a lot of stuff happening. Especially, well, since since the panel is about computing, I think uh, one thing that uh, I, I was just also talking about um, is is bringing the pieces together. I mean, first of all, yes, we need to make a, a more powerful biological neural network. But then ultimately, we also want to then interface that with something. So like bringing the pieces, like the different puzzle pieces together of biology and electronics. So like at some point, you're going to have to build a very well working, efficient interface between them so that you, you can either use this for well, hybrid devices or something like this or for biosensors or something like this where you have um, a biological system that then sends information to the electronic system that you can link up to the internet and then uh, you know like ha have have them working together seamlessly so i think that's that's a very challenging frontier but mm. I, I think that's uh, really where a lot of potential lies yeah so i guess to summarize you you brain computer interfaces that's uh i think that would be uh, that would be very cool i mean i uh, we're not there yet yeah. but uh, and obviously there there's also a lot of other people working on that, uh, mm. but I think that would be would be a very interesting and exciting thing to achieve. Speaking of that, anyone have any sort of thoughts and comments about BCIs and the future of where things are going in that space? Andrea, have you encountered some of that stuff in your uh, in your explorations in the new technology space? A little bit. I mean, we definitely do some work in BCIs at Accenture. We use it a lot for. Um, workforce training um, and um, to help people kind of get through um, some of the more challenging aspects of their daily lives. Um, but it's going to be interesting to think about how those um, devices become comfortable, become small, become ubiquitous, and how they connect to the broader ecosystems that we have. Mm. Jean-Anne, any thoughts about that? About brain computer interfaces? Yeah, any, um, any potential you know, uh, synergies with, you know, maybe magnetic spin computers and stuff like that. Yeah, so um, I think there's two things that come to mind when it comes to brain computer interfaces. Um, one is I'm very interested in how our neuromorphic computers can work alongside the brain. Mm. So like when Andrea said about a, what we sometimes call in sensor computing. So having our, our computers, whatever they're made out of, be able to directly sense the brain activity and then be processing, maybe you don't have to directly hook it up to the in, in any invasive way, but it can be processing alongside and um, then aid in what's going on. And then the other area I'm very interested in, it's not directly brain computer interfacing, but it's using our neuromorphic platforms that we're developing to better understand the brain. Mm -hmm. And that's its own kind of interface. And so um, I work with neurologists 
who are uh, studying um, diseases in the brain and also how infants develop their mm. um, ability to do different, different actions. And they are um, very interested in these neuromorphic platforms because it can be really difficult to um, really probe everything you want to probe in the brain. Mm. So being seeing it mimicked in these neuromorphic and artificial systems can give them more insight as well. And they can kind of work in concert. Oh, excellent. Maybe we can help with that space as well we, since we have a simpler brain in a dish. Yes, I yes. think you could. Yeah. yeah. Um, so I, I'm going to switch tack a little bit about this. And you know, it's something that I'm particularly very interested in is this this idea of um, Moore's law, right? Uh, are we, how far are we away from reaching the end of Moore's law? Or have we already reached the end of Moore's law? And what's next, right, in, in, in the processing space? Um, do, are we gonna get any smaller? Can we get less than one, I guess, nanometer? I guess it's impossible, but you know, wh where are we going with that space? Maybe you can start with this, Jinan. Uh, sure, yeah, yeah so um, it depends on who you talk to. I've definitely been um, like in the community of um, people who present on new devices for like uh, um, Intel and all the other big companies, Samsung, at our, our annual conferences. And I've seen over time that it used to be that these new types of concepts of Beyond Moore's Law were just sprinkled into those conferences. And now more and more every year, I just see it becoming more and more part of the conferences. Mm. So that gives me hope that like, even from the industry perspective, uh, I really do see this shift of them trying to look, like, getting a little worried and looking, okay, what, what else are we going to do um, besides try to make our, our, our chips smaller and denser? Yep. So, so in that sense, I think we are already there. Um, but, it's, but I do think there's a lot of need to really then try to push that um, from research to um, actuality. Mm. Yeah. Andrea, what yeah. do you think? I mean, it's, uh, it might be a good thing, right? If we reach the end and we no longer have to buy a new machine, <laughs> better for the environment. It's true, it's true, yeah. So definitely, I mean, I think that's where a lot of this like self-sustaining uh, intelligence systems comes in, right? To be able to create maybe more localized intelligence, more localized compute, um, to be able to solve for some of that. Um, but ultimately, I think we're going to have to rely on heterogeneous computing platforms, right? Where in some cases, um, and fully abstracted realistically from everyday people, right? Like some things just are going to run on one thing, on a CPU, some on a GPU. I mean, we already have that right in today's um, computers, but I think we're going to see that more and more where, you know, in some cases it's going to be a neuromorphic processor. In some cases it's going to be maybe going to the cloud to a quantum computer somewhere, mm -hmm. right? And in some cases you're going to have these devices that are very low power um, and that are running something very specific, right? That are doing maybe anomaly detection or doing online learning or adaptation um, in a very localized, low energy way. Mm. Then you're in a Ad, what do you, any thoughts about this? Well, I, I think, again, if you push the limits uh, you know, far enough down to where the classical computation reaches limits of building circuits, you, know, you can't make them small, small enough at some point anymore, then uh, yeah, I think alternative ways of computing, exotic computing, other things uh, might come in and then help with actually like still increasing our processing power to a certain extent, but with a different technology where, where again, you know, you have other challenges to overcome. So I think, you know, they, in a way, the, the, the law might still apply um, if, we, if we consider also the alternative technology. So like it, whether it's quantum or other things yep. uh, that come up that will, will increase our capacity for the future. So I, interesting. So I'm going to take a slightly different tech and approach now. So we've talked a lot about the, the computing platforms and so forth. But we haven't really touched on software. How do you program these things, right? And, and I, you know, what I think really is fascinating about you know, what you do at BitBio is, is programming cells, right? Like, like almost like the cells are computers themselves. Do you, do you want to talk a little bit about that? Maybe we can talk about, you know, neuromorphic and you know how how do we think of these things from algorithmic algorithmic points of view because you know as far as we know that's also one of the areas that quantum is also tackling with so how do we come up with better quantum supremacy algorithms yeah so maybe we start with you yeah so so i mean what what you alluded on uh, is is really um it's a different analogy of what we do so you're right uh, if you you can also see not only like your neural network as a computer but you can actually see every cell as running a program. So, so it is a 
computer itself and the hardware as the DNA, because I mean, every cell in our body has, has the same amount of genetic information, or well, almost every. Um, and then the question is, or what makes the difference really between one cell and another, uh, between a brain cell and, and a skin cell, uh, is really the program that they run, the, the genes that are active in the cell. And so this is kind of the concept behind what we, we do as a company, um, is really transitioning from one program to the other, so that's why we call it reprogramming, really. Like we, we try and impose a different identity on the cell with, with reprogramming methods. So like in a way, yeah, like you, you can say we work in, in software or we in biology call it epigenetics. Mm. So like you, you actually control uh, which, which genes are active and which, which is the cell type that you actually have. And so that actually offers for us not only opportunities in in making making neurons or making skeletal myocytes that are um, you know as close as possible to a human uh, but uh, it also offers us a little bit of potential for synthetic biology so like if we now look at the cell running a certain program the question is can we actually alter pieces of that program so that the cell actually not only fulfills its function as it does, but maybe it has some additional function. So like it, it, maybe it has some additional functionality as a biosensor or like it, it releases some, some antibodies that are, might be beneficial in a certain context. So this is really where, uh, yeah, it's al also a stepwise process for us. Right now we're working on making the best human cell types that we can. And then in the future, we're going to try and push the boundaries there as well and, and, and kind of make, make them in a way, like some sort of synthetic functionality in there as well. So, yeah. Incredible. The programming language of life. That's, <laughs> that's the way I, I would describe it. Andrea, any thoughts about the you know, software side? Because I know you're a software person and, and yeah. you've given a lot of thought about it. Yeah, so I mean, that's one of the biggest challenges, as you said, in neuromorphic systems as well, right? So when you think about neuromorphic systems, I mean, we've talked a little bit about the hardware um, from the processing side, but even when you think about event-based sensing cameras, for example, right? So there's neuromorphic-like cameras, and each individual pixel actually operates independently of the others, right? So it takes a big shift to think about, like, you know, normally when we think about cameras, we think about frame-based, right? But this is a very continuous, sparse data stream, right? Where only pixels that change are actually firing off at any given moment, similar to, right, live neurons. Mm. And so, the, conceptually, you actually have to think very, very differently. And one of the biggest challenges in, in adopting neuromorphic systems is that you have a lot of folks coming in from AIML backgrounds, traditional ones, that don't have neuroscience backgrounds, and that don't, that, that have a difficult time making that shift, right? So a lot of the work that at least we're doing right now and that we're starting to see you know, from other companies as well is to start to think about what's the right level of abstraction, right? And there's a lot of work to be done in the algorithmic side too because again, in a lot of cases, we're taking algorithms developed for silicon-based systems and trying to shove them onto neuromorphic systems and that just doesn't necessarily work, right? You're dealing with um, loss of accuracy, right? So you're not able to take advantage of you know, the real benefits of the hardware and the architecture, yep. right? So I don't have an answer per se, yeah. but it's definitely a challenge. And I think thinking about how we, how we step away from how we do software normally mm. is going to be really critical in working interdisciplinarily across neuroscience, biology, mm. computer science to start to develop new modes um, of programming. Uh, these systems is going to be critical. Mm. Jean, any thoughts? Yeah, well, building off of exactly what you're saying, I think that interdisciplinary need is so important. So what I see is that there's so much exciting innovation happening at the software level. Um, but it's amazing. We're all, maybe some of us call ourselves engineers, software engineers, electrical engineers, and yet we, it became challenging to talk to to each other in a way that we really understand each other. And I, I was recently at a, a conference where software engineers were showing, showing you know, inference plots, and I was showing inference plots. And we're like, well, we're showing the same plots. But you know, we, we really feel like we speak different languages. And so I think that um, 
is limiting our ability to really innovate more quickly. So the software engineers are like, OK, I'm happy using CMOS. I want to just like push on the software. Us over on the devices side, we're like, hey, how can we really communicate to you what we can do different? How can we de design um, software that can work with new, new devices? And we really just need to start to come together more and have more of this co-design attitude. Yeah, yeah, fascinating. I mean, I guess you know, the, 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 the sense I'm getting here as well is that there, there's a role to be played in education, right? If it's an exotic um, new and exotic compute platform, um, people need to learn how to do this. So any, any thoughts about how you know, we make this thing more accessible, we get the, the, the younger generation thinking about this, because these are eventually going to be the platforms that they will be programming in the future. Anyone? Jean, okay. you, you, oh. you, you, you teach, so. OK, yes, that's true. <laughs> um, so I think that this last like five to seven years or so, it, where this rise of normal for computing has been really exciting for um, the next generation of students. So I've seen um, in my electrical computer engineering department, there's always been the sense that like everyone's on the computer side mm. and less and less on the electrical side. So uh, I think that this very interdisciplinary subject really excites the students who wanted to go into machine learning and wanted to do that, but also loved their physics classes in high school. I see mm. so many of those students who come into engineering because they liked physics, but they're, they're either they loved or their dad or mom told them to <laughs> do engineering instead of physics. Yep. So I feel like those are the students who can really get excited about this space. And I think it has really revitalized on um, the hardware side of mm. ECE. Mm. So um, I think we should just keep, keep, um, keep that momentum going and, and really try to excite these students that want to have something to be excited about. Yes. Yeah. yeah. I, I mean, interdisciplinary programs are, I think, going to be key um, to, to getting some of these students trained up in these spaces. Um, but also one of the biggest challenges is the lack of resources out there, right? Mm. Um, we're actually conducting a set of interviews right now with neuromorphic experts to understand their software development processes. And by and large, one of the biggest answers that we get when we say, OK, well, when you're stuck, what do you do, is I email like one of two big names in the field. Mm -hmm. That is not a sustainable strategy, right? No. That is not a scalable strategy. That's right. And so being able to take the time to develop the resources, um, to develop the courses, to start to think about how we train these folks is going to be, um, it's going to be a big effort, actually. Certainly the case. Um, Dan, what are your thoughts? I mean, you know, it's a new field and how do you get people on board and, you know teaching them the stuff like epigenetics and, and how you program them i mean definitely it's uh, well I, I think it's been a recurring theme through throughout yesterday as well where a lot of people already said um like the the biggest the biggest thing is actually people so like the mm -hmm. people driving that and like that means uh, obviously for the future generations you need to get them excited about what you do and what you could do in the future with it right and so uh, yeah, I think uh, that's why also like events like this help because not only can you like kind of showcase what you're doing right now, you can get people excited, uh, and you hopefully are also able to get more young people into the relevant fields, and also more young people actually in this kind of interdisciplinary area because more and more we need to kind of work between disciplines to actually achieve what what we need. I mean, like what you were talking before about like using graphene you know as an interface and uh, you know all, all those things are you, you know you need people excited about it that then push the technology and push innovation in that field and so yeah like that's ultimately the the key to uh, yeah i mean we we all can do something right now to a certain extent but in the future we're going to need a lot more people to be as invested at least in it as we are right absolutely that's a uh, fantastic year so i guess the sort of Final minutes. Maybe we'll we'll go through the, the the panel and you know have you know closing thoughts about you know the space. What what you you know would love to see from it um, and and how you know how can we how can we do better to to you know get younger generations on board and 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 train them to be you know the engineers and the programmers of the future. Yeah. So um, you know, yeah, speaking more on the education and mm. as a professor, there's two things that come to mind. One is you guys are talking about like you want to excite them. So I think all of us, if we can call on you to create opportunities in your your companies, in your universities, and whatever you're doing for 
undergraduates especially to do summer and internships and make them aware that those are available. They, they want to get involved. They're just waiting for the opportunity. And then related to that, when it comes to diversity in our fields, which I know is something we all care about, um, I think thinking about how someone who maybe isn't always represented in a certain community can feel included. Mm -hmm. So there's issues of imposter syndrome, so how do we f help these new young people to feel like in these, these really complex spaces, how do we make them feel competent and capable? And two, how can we really leverage, like, I think this is such a great venue because it really shows that this is a creative field and one with a lot of vision, and that's what they want to see. They want to be inspired and feel like they're doing something inspiring. Mm. And so um, being able to, like, like, let's stop thinking of engineering and physics as being dry. How can we make it inspiring? And then that really help draw in a diverse um, population. Yeah. Amazing. Andrea? Yeah, I mean, I know that generally when, when undergrads especially go to school, right, they have to learn the theoretical foundations of their respective fields. And I think that that's absolutely critical, but I'd like to see more focus on just providing them with the skills to problem solve, mm. regardless of the field, right? Because that lets you take the things that you've learned and really apply them to new areas mm. and actually give those courses and those spaces um, to work interdisciplinarily, right? So there's a lot of engineering disciplines, for example, that have capstone projects, mm. but almost exclusively those are within a particular field or a particular mm. domain, right? What if those capstone projects weren't that, right? Yep. What if you had to work across mechanical engineering, electrical engineering, computer science, design, biology, right? Yep. And put together, right, like a team that finds a problem yep. in the world mm. and develops a solution, mm. right? So more and more of those kind of non-traditional ways of thinking, I think, get to the creativity, get to the excitement, and allow a more diverse set of people to come mm. together um, to, to tackle those. Certainly, breaking down those barriers and removing the silos, right? Yeah. Because, you know, that's that's the future where we're all going to be talking to each other, different ideas, different you know, perspectives, I think is, is, is truly a you know, uh, goal, a worthy goal for us to all uh, uh, strive for. Uh, final, final words then. Yeah, I, I think similar to that, uh, what, what you just said, like kind of breaking down silos and making connections, making connections between different disciplines. And that's why I think you know, me being here is more like, I don't know, I want to encourage you if, you, if you are thinking about anything in the biological space, like any, anything where you might have a cool application, like, like you with the neurons or like the other people making sausages or, uh, well, ultimately we're also trying to make cells for th therapy out there. So like we, we want to like push it to the clinic as well because like we, we believe that the cells we're making are actually, you know, the best uh, quality that you can get from, from human cells. Um, so yeah, like if you think about any biological problem, just like think about me or think about our company, and uh, yeah, like le let's have a chat and let's see how we can uh, we can do things in the future. Because I, I think connecting uh, to a lot of you guys out there is is really like one of the purposes why also I'm I'm here. Incredible. So. Well, that's Dan from Bitbio. If anyone is interested in biology and programming cells. You know where to find him. He should be around here for the rest of the uh, conference. Um, so I, I think, you know, without further ado, like, uh, like to thank our panelists here for their insightful comments and, and, and thoughts about this very exciting space that is uh, exotic computing. So just a round of applause for them. Thank you very much.